Okay, I think um, most of us has, has, have joined. Um, so I'll get started. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so today um, we will be talking about disaster recovery solutions and um, MySQL InnoDB cluster set in particular. Um, I'm Kenny Grip. I'm one of the product managers at uh, Oracle uh, for MySQL. And uh, with me, we have Miguel Araujo, uh, who's a software engineer uh, working on uh, in these products we'll be talking about. And uh, we'll be doing some slides on um, disaster recovery, the different solutions we have. And then also Miguel will be doing quite a lot of demos today. So, so we have a lot to cover. So uh, in terms of questions, there's a Q&A that you can ask questions and we'll try to answer them um, uh, during the presentation. We might type them or we might uh, kind of uh, uh, do it uh, live as well. So feel free to ask any, any questions you have. So let's get started. Um, so the Miguel has the controls. So first of all, disaster recovery. Um, when we talk about disaster recovery, we're talking about uh, large uh, outages uh, caused by various reasons. And here's a little survey from Uptime from 2020 uh, and showing the various causes of um, disasters. And you can see that on-site power is uh, still the biggest cause of, of these significant outages with 37%. And there's other issues like networking, cooling, uh, all kinds of reasons why uh, disaster recovery is um, uh, is needed or what when disasters happen. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you can see that disasters over time, um, the costs are also rising compared to before. So in 2019 versus 2020, you can see that a the cost of a outage um, is increasing and uh, more and more companies are uh, needing to uh, work on disaster recovery um, solutions. So if, we uh, kind of look at some examples on disaster recovery. Um, is, for example, the first here we have Delta. They had uh, a outage for about five hours, which costs uh, about $150 million, and it had to cancel a lot of flights. The same with British Airways. Um, so uh, an outage cost a lot of a lot of uh, canceled flights as well. OVH Cloud uh, is a uh, cloud services company in, in Europe, in France, and there was a fire uh, and that uh, caused quite a fire in a data center and that cost quite a lot of money as well for OVH and uh, impacted customers, uh, a lot of their uh, cloud customers as well. And the same with HSBC. So there's many examples where disasters happen and the impact of them is actually quite costly. Um, if we talk a little bit about MySQL, I would, before we go into kind of our disaster recovery solution, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, MySQL uh, solutions we have in terms of high availability, uh, what we did in the past, what we're working on for the last uh, kind of like five to seven years uh, in making all, all these solutions a lot easier and uh, manageable for, for users. Because a lot of users have to, uh, or a lot of DBAs or, or uh, whatever role you have, kind of have to shift from support, supporting one database to supporting multiple databases. So, that, so it's very important that we make MySQL as easy to use and easy to deploy as possible while still meeting a lot of these business requirements uh, or uh, while having this business continuity in, uh, in terms of high availability, uh, so local failure or uh, a disaster uh, as uh, shown before. So uh, let's let's show you a little bit what MySQL had in the past. And then if, you, if you're a long time MySQL user um, and uh, Kind of what the way you would deploy MySQL or you would re reach high availability is you would set up a replication topology. And how do you do that? You have like a, a primary MySQL server, you would create a backup or a snapshot, you would reload that snapshot onto a secondary, you use MySQL Enterprise Backup for a physical. Uh, snapshot, you redeploy that on a new server, you add some users, you configure replication. So there's a lot of work involved. And what MySQL uh, did was offering a lot of the technical pieces uh, of this whole uh, 
uh, part where we give the server, we have the, the enterprise backup or MySQL dump. So we gave all the little pieces, but it was up to the user to set up the high availability. And that's a lot of work that is required. And a lot of DPAs spent a lot of their time automating this architecture that they milk, make, but it's also customized because as they automate it, every user has to automate their own deployment um, or set up their own deployment. They will do it in some way that is quite, it's a lot of the things are, are similar, but there are some specialties about it too, the way they do it and, and so on. So also to do failover, there were some third party applications needed to automate this, or you had to write one yourself. So MySQL didn't provide any, any real uh, kind of integrated solution here. And that's kind of what the past, and, I, and uh, we still see, there's still users that do like this, but uh, since 2016, we've introduced a new product called MySQL InnoDB cluster, and that basically integrates and facilitates the setup of uh, such environment. Uh, and um, if we can, if you can look at the left, you could see we now have a uh, InnoDB cluster, uh, which is basically a set of multiple MySQL servers using group replication. And I'll go a little bit more in depth on what group replication is, but it's also very easy to set up because you use MySQL shell. So we have the regular traditional MySQL client, uh, which has been uh, there for, for more than 20 years. But then we also have a new one uh, since kind of 2016 area, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, the MySQL shell, a new command line client, which will help integrate and make this all very easy uh, uh, to, uh, to set up. We also have, uh, an, a MySQL uh, router, uh, which we have is a kind of a, a uh, proxy that uh, allows routing from the application connects to the router and then the router decides where to go depending on where it is a primary for read and write traffic or read traffic to a secondary. To then further integrate things better, uh, we've introduced InnoDB clone, which is a integrated way to take physical snapshots of one server uh, and then automatically deploy a secondary, get the data, a full physical snapshot of, a, of the data, which doesn't require any outside tools. It's all integrated within MySQL. It, doesn't, it only needs to connect using a MySQL connection to get that physical snapshot and deploy itself. So what we have here is that we can deploy on physical server, VMs, even containers. You just spin up an empty MySQL server and with using MySQL shell, just using MySQL connections remotely, uh, remote connection, so shell does not need local access, you can deploy such an uh, architectures very easily. And it's basically a couple of minutes, and if you don't have a big data set, if you have a larger data set, of course, it takes a little bit longer, uh, but just a couple of minutes, just a couple of commands to set up this type of architecture. So it's actually very easy. Um, due to the integration that, that we've made with InnoDB cluster. So this is 2016, uh, and I'll go a little bit more in depth on what InnoDB cluster is. But in 2020, we've introduced um, something similar, but uh, instead of using group replication, we're using asynchronous replication. So we have the same integration that MySQL InnoDB cluster provides with MySQL router, MySQL shell, doing kind of the management and automation of all this. We've introduced a way to do asynchronous replication uh, where you can have a primary and multiple secondary nodes and Shell will take care of everything. We'll initiate the clone to take a snapshot, provision the machine, configure replication, add users, everything. So again, setting up a more classic architecture, asynchronous is made very easy here uh, with InnoDB replica set. And it's the same kind of user experience. The user interface is the same as, as if you use MySQL InnoDB cluster versus how you, you know, the, use MySQL InnoDB replica set. So if we go to uh, the requirements, and maybe you can go back one slide, um, um, Miguel, is that for, for InnoDB cluster, what we provide here in terms of kind of a, um, uh, RPO, RPO. So RPO is the recovery point objective is how much data can you lose if there's a single server failing. So here we're talking about high availability. We're not talking about disaster recovery yet. Um, but with high availability, we have no data loss if a member fails. The failover is also automatic if a server fails and it will take seconds. There are some configurations options to tune and to set. So depending on your setting, it could take five seconds is the kind of the minimum, but uh, usually it's more like 30 seconds that, that you would configure it to. 
so 30 seconds for uh, after a server has failed, uh, like a new primary will, will be elected and a failover will occur. So that's fully automatic. If we go to InnoDB uh, replica set, um, the requirements are, 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 are the, what it provides is a lot different. As it's asynchronous replication, we don't guarantee that there's no data loss. Uh, also, we don't provide any automatic failover with asynchronous replication because of it being asynchronous, not fully integrated. The failover has to happen by shell. And uh, we uh, have no, uh, like, um, if, it, if it has to be done by a, a third host somewhere, a fourth host somewhere else, an, an external host, a monitoring node, then um, it, it, it is a manual failover is a lot better because automatic failover would mean that we would run some manage, external manager, management node that does help checks and then they might make the wrong decision. So we, we recommend InnoDB replica sets for when it's okay that there's failover of a couple of minutes or more because you have to initiate it yourself or automate it yourself. You can automate this very easily. If you really want automatic failover, then we really strongly recommend, well, your solution is to be use MySQL in a DB cluster, of course. Um, um, so because everything is fully integrated. And, and I think that's what we're showing next here in the next slide on what MySQL in a DB cluster really is. So before we go to the disaster recovery, little step back on InnoDB cluster. And uh, so we have, it's a different diagram. It's basically the same. So we have applications, MySQL router running there. We have MySQL shell, we have group replication. So we have all these combinations, all these pieces of software that we all integrate and make an end-to-end -end solution. If we now go a little bit deeper to each and what individual comment, um, uh, we'll explain what it is and what features deeper these provide. But the goal is that it's one product, it's MySQL. It's built by the MySQL team in Oracle. It's all developed together. We do QA, uh, full QA of the full, full stack, the full integration. Um, so that, that makes it a lot uh, better for, uh, for us, for the product uh, to, to develop it together as well. There's one client, MySQL Shell, to operate it. You'll see plenty of Shell uh, today on how to, how to use it uh, when we talk when we do the demos. Um, and what it also provides is um, basically the high availability distributed MySQL. So what we see is group replication uh, by itself does automatic failover. It does adding and removing members automatically. It does the provisioning. So if you add a new member, you just add an empty database and it will provision itself all automatically. So Shell doesn't really do anything. Shell just says MySQL server start, you should be part of the group uh, and it will provision itself. So everything is fully implement, uh, integrated within group replication, within the server. So no external tools needed or anything. Uh, group replication also provides con conflict detection and resolution. Uh, you can do active active. So multiple members, multiple nodes um, can be actively writing and there is integrated detection and conflict detection and resolution. So no split brain is possible uh, within group replication. Um, and uh, yeah, we prevent data loss uh, in this case, of course. Um, so how is this implemented? Well, group replication is basically uh, an implementation of replicated database state machines. So all writes within the whole group are ordered. So using XCOM protocol. So XCOM is uh, our Paxos implementation um, that we do to, to get consensus about uh, the order of transactions, which transactions can continue and not. Um, we have uh, everything built on MySQL technology. So this is using the replication framework. So um, if you're familiar with replication, you know binary logs, relay logs, global transaction IDs, group replication is built upon that. So it's just using this. So we've made it GA, generally available in MySQL 5.7, so in 2016, and we support all platforms that we support in general are supported, including Windows is even supported for this. There's some advanced features like uh, uh, configurable consistency guarantees. So in, in general, in MySQL architecture, when you write to one node, um, it is, so while Paxos guarantees that the transaction, when the transaction is committed, 
um, back to the application says commit has succeeded, we can guarantee that the majority of the members have received the transaction, but they haven't necessarily applied them yet. So it's possible if you write and commit transaction on one node and you immediately read it from another node that the data is not, the transaction hasn't been applied yet. But there are settings in group application where you can say, no, for this transaction, I want uh, no stale reads, I need full consistency. So you can kind of configure it on a session, on a global level, which type of consistency that you want. So um, so it's quite, quite powerful. Um, you can kind of uh, pick and choose uh, what, what you need. The default is eventual consistency. So you can have stale reads when you read from a uh, secondary. And that is fine for most use cases, but there are use cases where, where that needs to change. Uh, so that is, is possible. So some use cases, again, I've mentioned it, no data loss in the event of the primary member failing. So if the primary member dies and never comes back, the data will be, everything that was acknowledged back to applications is going to be available by another member uh, and the group will elect a new primary automatically and synchronize all the data. Um, there's also split brain prevention. Um, there's um, basically we use quorum. So if you have three members, then if one member is network partitioned and that one member was the primary, well, that one member will, will basically disable itself until the network partition is resolved. And the other two members who have majority, so more than 50%, uh, will elect a new primary and it will continue. So it will uh, automatically uh, kind of um, uh, guarantee no split brain in that way. So that's also why we recommend in most cases to have an uneven amount of nodes. Uh, but depending on your deployment, uh, yeah, it might be it might vary. So three to five, three five nodes is kind of what we see in most most deployments here. Another thing is the automatic failover. Uh, of course, the network partition handling fully automatic. Any any network partition that happens, the system will take care of this, and a new member will be elected as primary. Of course, if you only have two members and then there's a split between those two, none of them have quorum, none of them have majority. So it is possible in that case that, okay, we cannot allow any rights at that moment because there is no majority. So uh, it prefers to have um, uh, uh, basically, um, it, it, it prefers consistency over availability, basically. Um, Next, what we have is read scale out so we can add members. So in group replication, a group is limited to nine members um, and um, uh, you can use all these members to do reads. Um, so you can do kind of a read scale out with those consistency levels that I've mentioned. You can have full consistency, no stale reads on all of those members or not. It's all, it's all dependent on how you configure it. It's quite flexible. Replication lag is also controlled with flow control mechanisms. So when a member is starting to lag behind, uh, you can configure so that the primary starts slowing down write traffic to ensure that the group can that that some members in the group do not lag behind uh, more and more. So it will slow down throughput to make sure that all the members can catch up and uh, kind of do not create an ever increasing replication lag. It's very important that we don't have lagging members because any member can become a primary at any given time. So um, it's a, yeah, important that every, every member has has the, the right capacity and, and resources and uh, yeah, for this or flow control will kick in. It's it's very configurable. So you can you can disable it, you can you can have it start flow control later. So a lot of settings in there uh, to tune this. You can also do it active active writing to multiple or any member at the same time. So we guarantee consistency even in this case. The uh, write performance is uh, still uh, decent. We do optimistic clocking. So basically when the transaction is happening in one member and you do uh, begin a transaction, you do some writes, some reads, and, and maybe the transaction takes a couple of seconds. This all stays local to the machine. So you're just using InnoDB row locking. So there's no uh, lock communication happening during a transaction. Only when we commit the transaction, uh, the the transaction, kind of the right set, we call it, is being synced with other members um, and it's being uh, sent to the other members. So the only impact in terms of latency is when we commit a transaction. Uh, 
so the benefit there is that, that during the transaction, there's no impact at all in terms of latency, just that commit, uh, there's one round trip to the nodes. Uh, so it's, it's a single round trip uh, added uh, of latency that we need to add to the, the commit of the transaction. So right performance is actually quite good. We, we have uh, kind of users that do 10,000 transactions per second, uh, more uh, is possible even like 20,000. Uh, uh, we've seen around 20,000 we've seen as well. But um, the biggest thing is of course the, the larger, or sorry, the more distance the nodes are, if you do it across a wide area network and there's like a hundred milliseconds in between, that will Im impact throughput more as well than uh, as if, if it's local. When we talk about group replication, mostly we talk about high availability. So everything is deployed within the same kind of data center. Uh, but you can also use group replication as a kind of a disaster recovery solution. Um, and I'll cover that in one of the next slides. Um, so briefly on MySQL router. So router is kind of like the proxy, uh, the router that uh, load balances, uh, that uh, reconnects or uh, redirects traffic to a new primary if that's uh, that's needed after a failover. So you configure your application to connect to router and then router will kind of balance it to, to whatever is needed. Um, it is very light weight uh, process. It's little to no configuration is needed. Most of the configuration of router actually happens through uh, MySQL shell dynamically. So you don't have to go and log in on where the router is installed, change a config, restart it, and so on. Most of it is happening through shell. Um, so it has a stateless design. So there's it just follows the group. It just listens to any changes to the group or new members being added, it will automatically notice and adapt. So um, yeah, you don't have to kind of change change anything there. So it's fully integrated into replica set with asynchronous replication, InnoDB cluster with group replication, and also with cluster set, which uh, we'll cover next. One thing to note about MySQL router is that it is um, two TCP ports. You have one for primary traffic for read writes, and then one for non-primary traffic, which is for read traffic. Um, we have some features like TLS offloading, connection reuse, so reusing existing connections, but in general you need to think about router just re redirect TCP connections. Now to go uh, to the shell, uh, shell is a uh, client that is uh, has a lot more features than uh, standard um, uh, MySQL client. So the default language when you log in is JavaScript. You also have a Python mode and an SQL mode, uh, and you can script, you can add your own extensions to shell. Uh, you can do relational SQL, or you have even the doc, uh, doc store. So document models as well is supported to it. Um, you can use MySQL shell using the classic MySQL protocol, but we also have the X protocol, which is used in integration of, of these architectures as a new protocol. Well, not new since 2015 or something like that. We've introduced the X protocol that also does the document store uh, or uh, just a regular uh, SQL as well. Has, has a lot of extra, extra features um, um, in the X protocol. So it supports everything. So shell um, is very important there. Now about disaster recovery, um, cluster set, MySQL InnoDB cluster set. So we have MySQL InnoDB cluster, and now we have MySQL InnoDB cluster set. So what is MySQL InnoDB cluster set? It's basically multiple MySQL InnoDB clusters attached to each other. And we have in this diagram, you can see on the left, we have Rome, which is the primary cluster, which has its own three members or however members you want. And then it replicates asynchronously to another cluster in Brussels. Uh, and it's uh, basically uh, what we have here is, is within a data center for high availability, so failure happening within a region, we can guarantee no data loss, a failover of seconds because of group replication functionality. If a region fails, let's say Rome fails entirely, we don't guarantee that there's no data loss. Failover is manual, but automated in terms of like uh, initiating the failover and we'll show that demo that today but the benefit here and this is this is good for many many um, business meets many business requirements is that uh, it's 
less likely that a disaster will happen. So it's okay to lose a couple of seconds or a couple of milliseconds of data and to be manual failover than it is uh, automatic uh, than an automatic failover. But the benefit here is, is there is no right performance impact. So you, you can have Rome, Brussels, it could, could be Rome, uh, it could be Tokyo for all we want. Uh, there's not gonna be an impact in right performance um, for committing transactions. So everything stays local. So because of that, because it is asynchronous, benefit no right in performance impact, we also cannot guarantee that there's no data loss. Um, so again, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to add, remove members, clusters even. Router is fully integrated, so you don't need to run multiple different types of routers. We can all change the router behavior online uh, through the MySQL shell. And we'll cover, cover that later when, when we start the demos very soon. You can also have multiple, uh, here's an example of three data centers. So we can have uh, one primary in the middle, Rome, and then why not add Lisbon and Brussels? We can have um, as much clusters as you want. It's all asynchronous replicating uh, from one, the primary cluster to the secondary uh, clusters. <clears throat> now, talk about, let's talk a little bit about business requirements and then we'll go into demos very shortly. Um, so first of all, uh, as mentioned, we've got two concepts. Uh, and we have recovery time objective and recovery point objective. RTO is how long does it take to recover from a specific failure? And recovery point objective is how much data will we lose when a certain failure occurs? And these are very important metrics to know what, does, what, does the, what can the business have? Of course, the more strict it is, like when we want no data loss when a failure happens, it becomes more complex to do. So with group replication or InnoDB cluster, we can say no data loss within a region, but there's different types of failure. We have high availability. Is this what group replication, uh, as we mentioned, solves, with, which is a single server failing. There's a network partition, a local network issue. But with disaster recovery, we're talking about a whole region failing. So it's important to know that RTO, RPO can be different. And, is, and in many cases, is different depending on high availability versus disaster coverage. You might want no data loss in high availability, but okay, some data loss is okay when a disaster happens. Um, so you need to figure out what does your application, what, what, what is the business accept in, for this specific application? There's another type of failure and that is a human error where somebody drops a database or an application bug that more data gets deleted or updated than, than uh, yeah, do some bug. Maybe the, the, the where clause is gone uh, in some delete and then it deletes the whole table. That's kind of a human error, we call it. And uh, how fast do you recover from that? That's a whole other thing. It's out of scope for this presentation, but then it's about backups and point in time recovery, basically that has to happen. So also important to know, is how, what is the RTO and RPO of that one? Because it's important to have some process at least to know how to do this, uh, because that's a very stressful situation when that happens, of course. So, so to give some recommendations is that if we talk about high availability and the various requirements, uh, we've mentioned it briefly, is that if you want no data loss and you want RTO to be uh, seconds, basically, you want to use InnoDB cluster. If you don't, have any data, if you're okay with some data loss uh, and you're okay with uh, the, the time to fail over to be minutes or however, how fast you can, can do this, um, then replica set is, is uh, better for you. Now, why would you ever want to use MySQL InnoDB replica set? Well, right performance is going to be better because it's fully asynchronous. So um, um, if the primary uh, does not need to wait on secondaries to catch up or receive transactions, um, in an asynchronous system. So the you know, DB replica set will have a better write performance. Uh, it's also used sometimes where networks are not stable. Uh, maybe there's a lot of packet loss at times or, or not enough bandwidth. So then the you know, DB replica set is the way to go because the you know, DB cluster does assume really good network and any net packet, uh, major packet loss or network partitions will affect who is the primary, new primary will will be elected. There will be no right transactions going through if it can, if Paxos cannot get consensus from the majority of the members. So that's that's very important. So that's why when InnoDB replica set is used. But if you don't have strict requirements, it's fine to use InnoDB replica set. 
When we go to multi-regions, there's two solutions. And I've talked, we've introduced InnoDB cluster set, but also don't forget, you can deploy MySQL InnoDB cluster across three regions. You can have multi-primary enabled and write to each one of them and have them all primary. If you deploy them all in three regions, you also have automatic failover if a whole region fails. Because if one region fails, there's two regions that, that remain active. You can also um, add multiple members to each region. So you can do two members in each region, which is six members, or three members in each region. Now, it's true that if you do two members in three regions, you have six members, which is an even amount. But given that they're located in three different data centers, um, then um, the, the chance that you have a 50-50 split is very, very low. So it's okay to have an, an, an even amount in that case. So you have a local failover if a, if, if a member dies and you, have an, uh, you still have another member in the same region. Um, but the other um, yeah, members are, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one, so you have high availability within a region. And then when a region goes away, uh, another region can take over automatically. Now, important, don't do this over the internet where pocket loss is happening. And then uh, sometimes it, connectivity is, is, is gone. Make sure you have kind of very stable, dedicated lines for this. And the latency, of course, impacts every transaction commit. So the bigger the latency between those regions, the more, the slower uh, the commit uh, time will get. But you'll have no data loss when a region fails and failover will happen within seconds, or let's say you put it to 30 seconds or 60 seconds, you give it uh, kind of the balance, right, of, of, of how long do you want to wait, especially with uh, lo 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 longer latency networks, uh, you might want to increase this a little bit. Um, it's kind of the, the expel timeout setting, if you're familiar with group replication already. So it's, it's configurable. So that's deployed. We, there are many users of this, but the, the majority of our, our use cases from our customers that we see is, okay, we're okay with some data loss. We're okay with manual failover if a region fails. And here we come to MySQL InnoDB cluster set. So no write performance impacted by adding this secondary region. It is manual failover. Some data loss is possible, uh, but it's a uh, very low, low impact as well. So I guess this is it in terms of slides. Uh, it took kind of a, quite a bit. Uh, let's go to, to, to the demos. Um, now, before we do the demo, what, what Miguel has prepared is three servers, and we assume that every server is a region here. Uh, so you can see we have Rome, Brussels, Lisbon, and each of them have three different machines uh, or three different MySQL uh, processes running. And let's just, just to kind of mimic the uh, uh, three regions with three MySQL databases in, in each. If you want, every command that we use today is available on, on GitHub. So when you have the slides, you can click on it. And uh, there's kind of like a, a cluster set demo uh, where you can kind of do this yourself uh, if you want to learn more about this. And yeah, uh, I'll give it to, to Miguel to show the demo. All right, let me, okay. So what we have here, I have, I am connected to one of the regions, to Rome. Um, on the top, I have MySQL shell. Um, to speed up things, since we, we don't have much time, I already created the primary cluster, the first one in Rome. I'm gonna connect to it just to show you. So the commands you see, it's what we call the admin API, the API to manage GenoDB cluster, replica set, and cluster set. I'm getting the Rome object. You can see the list of, we have auto completion in shell. You can see the list of commands available. So just to show you the status of our Rome cluster. Load up. Okay, so our cluster in Rome, Three member cluster, 3331 being the primary accepting region rights, and 3332 and 333 as the secondary members uh, of our cluster. Um, I've also deployed a, a router. You can see these routers. We have one router running. Here on the bottom is the, I'm just tailing the, the log of a router. Um, it's all good. And we have two applications uh, written in Python using the connector. One to do write traffic, 
starting it and another one to do just uh, read traffic. And you can see router here uh, on the left, sending all the right traffic to the primary 3331 and on the right uh, doing load balancing between the two secondaries. Okay, so the first step now uh, is to create a cluster set out of our cluster. So for that, I will use, I will use my Rome object and I will use the create cluster set command, which requires um, a parameter that is the name. Uh, this is mandatory, let's call it just cluster set. We have now the, our cluster set um, object and let me show you the status. And you can see our cluster set that is just composed of a cluster ROM. That is uh, the cluster role is the primary and the primary memory is 3331. And we have two other, um, the, we're gonna create now the two replica clusters out of it. So for that, we have the CS object. We're gonna do create replica cluster. I'm gonna create um, one in Brussels. So Brussels 441, I'm gonna call it bra. And we're gonna use clone to do provisioning. Shell takes care of everything. We'll now provision instance to be uh, the one on where we create the cluster. It shell will now configure the replication channel. Uh, between the two clusters, we'll synchronize everything, we'll update the topology, we'll handle the metadata and so on. And the router needs now to be reboot strapped. And that's because um, router by default uses 0 0.5 uh, seconds as TTL. Uh, that's the refresh on metadata. And uh, with cluster sets, that's way too low because uh, for wide networks that's too low. So we, we need a reboot strap so router adjusts the value to be higher. So I'm gonna reboot strap router. Here's the command. And I'm gonna stop it and start it again. Okay, router is up and running. You can see all good in the bottom. We can see now the status of our cluster set. We have Brussels as the replica cluster, Rome as the primary. We can use the extended option to get more information about it. The extended, uh, you can use one, two, or three. That's three different levels of information. Using level one, we can see the whole topology of our cluster set with Rome, with the three members, and Brussels that only has one member so far, uh, the one that I created on the instance running on 4441. And you have here information about the cluster size replication channel. Um, all good, waiting for an event for the coordinator. The receiver, the receiver is the primary member of the replica cluster that is running on 4441. And the source is the primary member of the primary cluster. So now we are going to um, connect to Brussels. Brussels 4441. There's a mess missing. I'm going to get the cluster object, bro. You can check the status. You can see here on the status that is indicated that this is a replica cluster. And what I'm going to do now is to add more members to it. So we have uh, HA with three members, like Kenny was explaining before. So let's start with 4442. I'm going to use clone to provision. As you can see in the information in the output, Shell will take care of the replication channels and set up everything, create the user, the, the replication accounts, handle everything transparently. Let's add another member. By default, we use clone to provision. Can you also use the incremental recovery? But the clone is much faster. Okay, let's see the status of our cluster set now. So 
So we have now three member primary cluster and a three member replica cluster with the primary. As you can see here, um, the three members are read only mode. The replica clusters are read only, they don't accept writes. And the information about replication channel here. So now I will create uh, another, oh, the Lisbon cluster. I will use the same, the create replica cluster command. This is the other region, Lisbon, 5551, let's call it Liz. And again, let's use clone, that is much faster. And again, we just use add instance command. Lisbon add instance to add two other members. So we had we have full HA within the region with three members. That's it. We have our cluster set with three clusters, Rome as the primary, Brussels, and Lisbon as replica clusters, replicating from the primary, all set up, up and running. And this is how you set up a cluster set, very easy. Um, if you would like to check the topology without status information, you can use the describe command and we'll give you the topology without status, just the information about the address and the names of the, each server that composes the, the whole topology. Um, this is it for the setup. Let's get back okay. to the slides. So yeah, so what we did is we created the cluster set with three clusters. Um, the router was bootstrapped. Um, did you do that exercise already, Miguel? Yes. Perfect. Up and running and accepting traffic. Perfect. So now what we're going to do is do some exercises. Uh, some so basically changing primary, and there's changing primary and there's various different ones, right? So uh, if you can go next slide. Um, so we have this kind of setup. Let's say Rome and Brussels. So let's forget about Lisbon for a bit. In this uh, example, where we will um, change uh, the primary cluster. Um, and what you do with that is you use the set primary cluster func uh, uh, function. Uh, we're going to change the primary member now. So I am seeing a slide on. Within the cluster. OK, you go. You go. Go show that first, then before yeah. we go to this. Sure. So All what right. I wanted to show is. Um, what happens when you do a, a switch over of the primary member of the cluster? So a planned switch over. So for example, Lisbon, uh, our primary is uh, running on 5551. Um, we can do a set primary instance and we change it to, for example, 5552. And this will tell group application to switch the primary uh, to the one we want. And cluster set will automatically adapt, and the replication channel on Lisbon now will be replicating from the new primary to the cluster set primary. So if you can, you can see here in the status, going up a little bit here, 5552 is the new primary. And if we see the um, replication channel information that is here, you can see receiver Lisbon 5552 and the source Rome 3331. So this was just to show the, um, the switchover of the primary. And also I can show the switchover of the primary of the primary cluster, Rome. Um, let me connect to it, cluster admin. Let's get the cluster object and let's change 
the primary that was ROM 3331. As you can see, router is sending traffic there. We can change to uh, 3333, for example. And as you can see, router automatically adapts to the change. It's now sending traffic to ROM 3333. And the all, all the other uh, replica clusters that were replicating from the previous primary are now replicating from the newly elected primary. OK, so this was just to show the switchover of the primary yes. member uh, within each cluster. Yep. So now we're going to change the primary cluster. So using set primary cluster. So what we need to do in this case, or what Shell needs to do is configure, reconfigure the asynchronous replication. So one important note is that, and uh, it's, I think it's important to repeat is, this is a primary cluster and multiple replica clusters. We do not support and cannot, will not support having multiple primary clusters at any given time. So it's asynchronous replication. There is no conflict detection in uh, asynchronous replication. So we cannot guarantee uh, doing kind of like active, active asynchronous re uh, replication between clusters. If you want active, active across multiple regions, what you need to do is, uh, is deploy MySQL in ODB cluster across uh, one region. That's what we've shown uh, in kind of the business requirements channel. So it's always primary and then a second, multiple secondary clusters. Um, so the switch over. Um, so what happens is, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, what will happen is the reconfiguration that will happen if we do it is that Brussels will become primary and then replication will be changed and Rome will become the replica. What we do do here is a switch over. It's not a failover. So this is planned. And what we guarantee is that there's consistency. So there's no data loss happening in this command. Uh, router will automatically detect that traffic has to be redirected to the new primary cluster. So no need to change any of your routers. Um, wherever they run, uh, they will automatically follow the new, new topology as needed. So Miguel, if so you can show us. do it. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so do we have a cluster set object? Yes, we do. So right now, Rome is the primary. Let's switch over to, I don't know, Brussels. So for that, we use the set primary cluster command. We only need to tell the command which, which is the cluster that we want to elect as primary. And we run it. And Shell will handle everything. As you can see on the bottom, router is already sending traffic to the new primary. So Brussels 4441 and the uh, read-only traffic also to, to Brussels uh, using the secondary members now. Um, there's uh, the output here of the command that explains everything that is happening. So Shell, uh, like Kenny was saying, changes the replication channel configuration. It updates the, the configuration on each member accordingly. Uh, it does a bunch of other things. It uh, ensures the data sets are consistent by reconciling the GTID sets uh, because of the view change uh, events of group application. This is something more more technical. Uh, we also do metadata updates in the views to ensure uh, things are up to date and router understands the changes as well. And this is it. We can take a look at the status. Brussels as primary, Lisbon and Rome are the replicas now. And the global primary instance is Brussels uh, 4441, which is the primary member of uh, Br Brussels cluster. And this is it for the um, switching the primary. Let's talk about router. Router, yeah. So in terms of router, um, so normal deployment of MySQL router is that you deploy router at, on every application server, or you can have a separate layer of where you install a router, like you can put it on different hosts, of course. But let's assume we install a router on every application server. So it's very, very lightweight router. So it only takes like a little bit of memory, doesn't use a lot of CPU. So it, uh, you can have many, many routers. Um, that's okay. It doesn't cause a lot of overhead on the, on the cluster itself. So for router integration, uh, the only thing we need to do is the application configures uh, co its connection to the router and then router takes care of the rest. Now, we have read, read, write traffic in red, read traffic in green. 
uh, or red traffic is kind of like primary reads and writes combined. So we have different target modes in router, um, and we have we have two. And if you look at the Rome data center on the left, there's two routers, and they are on different target modes. So when we are um, basically when writes go in on the target uh, on MySQL router that has target primary, what it does is that router will always follow the primary for re for both its primary and then non-primary traffic. So for uh, writes and and read traffic. Um, also in Brussels, there's a router that has target primary. There it will send all traffic to the primary cluster. So uh, router will automatically redirect everything to, to Rome, to the other region. Um, the target Brussels, so in, in the other router with, tar uh, with, with target Brussels, um, for example, reporting application, you don't want to go to the other uh, uh, data center, you want to remain local, well, you can configure that router, router to say, okay, that router is in Brussels, let's target Brussels, and it will send its read traffic to the Brussels uh, cluster as well. Now, uh, because, um, because uh, the primary cluster is not Brussels, the MySQL router does not accept the right traffic. If Brussels becomes primary and right traffic comes through this router with target Brussels, then um, it will accept and open up the port to allow read and write traffic. So you can configure this per router instance. You can change this online. And uh, I think uh, Miguel is going to show this. Um, and yeah. Uh, if you can. Yeah, that's the key point. We can change everything dynamically using shell and router will, yeah. will, uh, will act. So. Um, Let's show the command to list the routing options. So um, you can see under global the, the options, the validated cluster policy, drop all by default, uh, the target cluster, as Kenny was explaining, uh, routers follow the primary by default. So to change the option, we use um, the command set routing options. Uh, we want to change just to show the target cluster. And um, let's use Rome. So for example, the, um, the reporting application that Kenny was telling us about, uh, Rome is now a secondary. So if we change the option, what is gonna happen now is that the right traffic on the bottom left is refused because Rome is a secondary, is a replica cluster. And the read traffic is gonna be forwarded, forwarded to, to the secondary instances of the cluster Rome that is a replica cluster. And this is how you change uh, the routing option. Um, there's other options that are also changeable through, through shell. And um, yeah, just if I set it back to primary, um, right traffic is now accepted in Brussels. That is our primary cluster. And if you need a combination of I want read traffic to stay local and primary always to go to the primary cluster, um, run two routers. That's uh, what we recommend. You can have multiple routers running, just listening on a different port or only listening on the read write port or the read only port. So you can you can kind of do this as, as it's very lightweight, of course. Now uh, we almost have we have a couple of minutes left, so let's do some failure scenarios. Um, let me, so okay, let's so start by go ahead, yeah. Uh, by showing the failure of the a primary member of the cluster, which is uh, to see what happens uh, with the replication channel. So if we make um, the primary of the primary cluster that is Brussels fail, so let me. Uh, This is Brussels. Let me just kill the process. Uh, for, for, for one. So I just killed the primary and we can take a look at the status. As you can see, router is now uh, failing because the primary election is ongoing. So it should take just a few seconds. Okay, a new primary was elected, 4442. Router is already sending traffic there. And if we see um, 
the status information, you, we will see that the replication channel is already replicating from the new um, the new primary that was elected, that is Brussels 4442. Um, I don't know if, if we have time to show the disaster, the network partition. Yes, please do that. Um, but do you need to bring it back or? Yeah, yeah. So um, what we're going to do is to isolate the primary cluster. Um, so I'm going to use IP tables. IP tables. I'm going to block input from Lisbon. I reject it. And I'm going to block to that point. OK. So we, ha we have isolated the primary cluster and uh, ROM. And uh, to create a, 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 a failure scenario. Uh, now the, 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 the process, actually, I, I, I fenced ROM and should have been Brussels. Yes, you fenced only one. So, it will continue yeah. to work. Yeah, I fenced. I fenced the wrong one, but I, I can. I can. So, Brussels is the primary. Which one are you? Are you you're fencing the primary, right? Yes, I'm connected okay. to Brussels right now. So Brussels is fenced, and uh, now the next step uh, of the failover first is that you should fence your primary cluster from read traffic, and for that you use the um, the um, the command is uh, fence writes. This will fence the cluster from write traffic, so router won't send any traffic there. And right after that, you can perform a failover using the force force primary cluster uh, command to uh, this is disconnected. I need to connect to it to do the failover. Okay. So what happens if if you fence one cluster? You need uh, so if you if a cluster is network partitions, what you should do is fence that cluster first and then do the failover. Um, we have some slides on that. Um, maybe show the show the slides. Yeah. Run out of time. Can you show the next slide? Here, we did created a network partition, or that what was our intent is to create a network partition. And what we want to do first is that, okay, Rome is out. We need to make Brussels the primary. Um, so go to the next slide. What we want to do first is we want to fence uh, the Rome cluster because the, the Rome cluster is still accepting rights. So we don't guarantee that there's no split brain, right? So first you have to fence it. There's a couple of se settings. You can do fence rights. You can do fence everything. So first you log in on Rome if you have access to this, of course, if it's completely network partition, maybe you as an admin cannot log in, but uh, let's assume we can. So you fence uh, first and then the, the cluster really stops accepting rights or and or reads. And what we need to do then is we need to do the failover. So in the, that's in the next slide, is that we uh, basically connect to the Brussels cluster and then say, okay, force, you need to become the primary now. And what will happen is, is that the primary cluster, uh, Brussels will become the primary cluster, router will adapt, the routers that are still able to connect to the new primary will be, be able to see the change in the, in the metadata and follow the new primary cluster. Now, when the network partition is resolved, which is in the next slide, we can, uh, first of all, the cluster is fed. It will not do not accept its rights. In this case, it's everything is read only. But what will happen is the router will see, oh, I have a new primary. Um, I can connect to, to, to one of the other clusters and it became the primary and it's a, a newer primary. You kind of know that this happened uh, later uh, and the routers will automatically reconnect to, uh, to, the, to the Brussels uh, to send its write traffic and read traffic depending on the target cluster uh, setting. Uh, so uh, oh, this is all automatic. So router, you don't have to do any operation with router. This, this is fully automatic. You can then as a next step, unfence the cluster 
uh, and then bring back the, 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 the cluster that was that's failed if there was no uh, kind of like split brain, of course, if no transactions went through on that data center that the other one hasn't received yet. Anyway, I think we're two minutes over time. Um, if you have any, yeah, I've seen, we've answered a lot of the Q&A questions. Uh, most of them I see. Um, so yeah, uh, this was our introduction on InnoDB cluster set and how to get disaster recovery. Um, thank you for uh, attending today. And yeah, hope to see you in another webinar.